Well, greetings, everyone. I want to give you some brief lessons that I've learned in 30 years of working with peer learning programs, helping to do national and international dissemination of one program, and talking with lots of staff and faculty members who have started their own peer learning programs on campus. So here's just kind of a quick overview of a few lessons that I've learned over the years. First of all, oftentimes administrators tend to want to focus on how much is this thing going to cost? And I think this is the reason why evaluation of, of programs all the time is important because you need to remind them of what the cost of failure is in terms of students who don't pursue or complete uh, degree programs, uh, the loss of revenue due to the loss of tuition, and all the rest. And that's the reason why there's this kind of balancing act here in terms of what is the cost of failure rather than the cost of implementation. I did my uh, dissertation work uh, when I was at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, helping to direct the National Supplemental Instruction Program. I was able to go and do a research study of 350 institutions that had SI programs. And the results were really quite surprising. Whenever we look at the active programs versus the discontinued programs, they were actually kind of mirror images of one another. I won't read all the slides up here. I just want to draw a few highlights. Training is essential, not only before the academic term, but also during the academic term. Lots of time and energy needs to be given in order to be able to coach and mentor these young people who are going to do responsibilities that actually in some ways equal those of what instructors do. We need to give them some coaching, so we need to go and do some observations of them and watch them actually while they're doing their work. We need to have a classroom instructor who's highly supportive of the program to give some positive reinforcement to the students to be participating. We also need to frequently evaluate the program. Those were all the things that came up out of the research when I looked at programs that were still active and offering their programs. When you look at the discontinued programs, they're all nearly identical to the ones over on the left-hand side. If you don't do these kinds of things, well, that tends to correlate with a program that's discontinued. The most interesting one, I think, in some ways, is this final one down here. The trained person who was running the program leaves the institution. Somehow, and you'll see this pop up in another slide in a moment, sometimes administrators see this is David's program, or LaQuisha's program, or Fred's program, rather than the institution's program. In terms of participation options, well, there's lots of them. Some programs, well, there isn't any question about involvement because it's integrated inside of the class. Some programs actually make them go for a while till the first examination. Some end up requiring most weeks for them to participate. And then you see the other ones down here. Voluntary programs do have a weakness, and that is sometimes the students who most need to be at those sessions choose not to come. Oftentimes, the reason why they don't want to come is because of stigma. They feel like it's a program that's only for students who are going to drop out. Actually, the research is quite clear among all of these peer learning programs. They're an enhanced learning opportunity for any student, regardless of your academic preparation level. But for students who have had a history of academic difficulty, it's really hard to voluntarily say, I need to get more help. They'd rather not go at all. This high institutional support is absolutely critical, both for the faculty member as well as the academic department. You want classes that have high rates of D's, F's, W's, and I's, but sometimes the class with the highest rate is not the class to go to if the faculty member is not going to provide positive reinforcement for students to take advantage of this as an enhancement to their learning, not just simply as a 
protection from getting a low grade in the class. The faculty member is absolutely key. He doesn't really, and she doesn't really need to say much of anything, just a few messages throughout the term, a few reminders that that person endorses this program and recommends for anyone to participate in it. You need to have ongoing professional development for the people who are leading these programs. First of all, to get initial training, then going off and seeing other programs in the area to learn lessons from them, and also going to the annual conference that's offered by most all of the major national programs. We need to keep up with this. We need to reinforce for the administrators that this is actually their program. If you happen to leave who's been managing the program, you can be replaced. You can find people with the right qualifications. Provide them the same kinds of resources that you had, and the program can continue. I won't read all of the words up here on the slide, but there's lots of places to go for training. And also, once the program is established, also to go for certification of the program. Those two things going together can really help a program to continue to improve their quality. And here's just simply a short little list of some of the alphabet organizations that are out there. There's plenty of places. You'd like to have more information, just simply contact me and I can talk to you about those. It's absolutely critical that you evaluate your program every academic term that it's being offered. I could read off all the PowerPoint slides, but I just want to emphasize this one down here at the bottom. We need to build the case why with such strict and difficult financial times, why is it the institution wants to invest? For everything they invest in, they have to tell two things, no. You need to build the case with evidence on why your peer-listed program, your PAL program, is a good place to invest funds whenever things are difficult on trying to find enough budget. You need to anticipate future needs. You never know whenever suddenly you're going to get a directive from your supervisor to create an online program. I read about this all the time. There's not a lot that has been written down about it. We hear about them. They make some presentations at conferences, but there's not a lot of literature out there to help you to be able to do it. It's a very complicated activity. That's the reason why it's critical to start anticipating future needs. You may not want to do an online program, but you need to know how you would be able to do it in case your supervisor gives you a month, a semester, or if you're really fortunate, an entire year to be able to prepare for that. And that's the reason why it's important for professional development is going to all of these kinds of training opportunities to learn more, particularly at the conferences. PAL really is, peer-assisted learning really is more than PAL. It's more than simply a support program for students to get higher grades. It's also, it's a co-curricular program for the facilitators. I talk about that in some other separate videos. They have an incredible growing experience as they are serving as a facilitator. Also, you need to use that information about all of this co-curricular opportunity whenever you're in the recruitment phase on why it is that a pretty gifted student will choose to work with your program versus all the other options that they'll have on campus. We also need to take advantage of some of the other programs on campus for potential sources of these facilitators. And I actually talk about that separately in another video, so I'll not say much more about that. Also, PAL can benefit faculty members. Number one, they're going to have better prepared students inside the class, be better at participation, asking questions, and earning high grades, which any instructor wants to see his students do. Also, in some cases, and this is mostly true in other countries, like in the United Kingdom and also in South Africa, the faculty members actually ask for the facilitators to give them some anonymous feedback about what's going on inside of the sessions and what is it 
that the faculty member ought to know about what's going on. That can be, in these contexts, in other countries, they find that to be very helpful feedback information. Maybe not so much here in the United States. Time is the most expensive thing that goes into a highly successful program. It's not always the cash, not only the technology, but it really it's the time. And that's one of the things that has to be budgeted for. Whatever you think it's going to take for you to run the program the way you would like to, it's probably much more. That's the reason why I kind of put this slide in on a serious note. It takes a long time to build a really successful program. There are so many moving parts, so much that you're in your own growth cycle on. Even if you're an established uh, leader of a peer learning program, there's so much more that you could learn about. And that's the reason why this is a long-term process. And finally, the final slide here is just to remind you where are some places that you can receive more information about peer learning programs. One of them is a web page I maintain with lots of resources. Also, I've created a YouTube channel for, obviously, this particular video I've created, but also it highlights other peer learning programs, so it's lots of other sources. Also, I have a podcast in which we have a mix of interviews with student facilitators talking about their experience, as well as I'm also talking about what are some of the new research articles that have come out. I have a bibliography on the six major international or national peer learning models. Well, all of the articles that I've been able to locate, and at this point it's something like at about 1,400 of them, about probably about 40% of which are available online. So it's a great place for you to go to if you want to be able to look at the professional literature and actually, you can even download the EndNote database that I use. And then finally, if you want to see a sample of a training notebook that someone else uses, this is the one that we used at our institution. It's something like 200 or more pages long. So it's not perfect, but it's a sample. And you might want to take a look at it to integrate some of the useful parts into your own program. And then finally... Give me a call on the phone. This is the general website. And also send me an email. I'd like to be a resource for you. Thanks for listening.